On March 11th, I was in headquarters and I watched the tsunami going all the way through the land and that was devastating. It began with the strongest earthquake in Japan's history. Nuclear officials there are warning of a possible nuclear reactor meltdown. Thousands within a six mile radius were evacuated and cooling agents were rushed in, part of a desperate effort to avoid the worst. I remember clearly because my daughter was born on March 7th. I went to the hospital to pick them up and at hospital, I saw the explosion. I was so shocked. I said to my wife that huge devastating accident happened in Fukushima. I thought the possibility that Tokyo is totally ruined. I thought that we cannot use nuclear anymore. We lost global trust of, for the Japanese technology by the Fukushima accident. We betrayed, in a way, how safely we can use the nuclear power. I used to work for Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, METI. I am Nobuo Tanaka. I'm living in Tokyo. I was the executive director of the International Energy Agency, IEA, in Paris. Japan's problem is the energy security because we don't have energy source. Our dependency on the Middle East for self-will is almost 99%. So what's the problem for Japan in terms of uh, energy security as well as the sustainability. Oil shock in 1973 created a panic in Japan. In 1973, the big Middle East producers cut off oil shipments to major consuming countries. And uh, we try our best to the energy efficiency, conservation, starting nuclear power, coal at the same time. So diversification effort. When we started nuclear power after the first oil shock, perception on the nuclear was very favorable because nuclear is, is that power or energy for the future. We had about 50 uh, reactors all over Japan, and our performance was considered to be very, very good and safe. So the public accept the nuclear power. It was working very well just before the accident Japanese government, utilities, and nuclear academics lost the public confidence. 11 years on from the Fukushima disaster, nuclear plants remain deeply unpopular. I think getting public ac acceptance of nuclear is more difficult than other countries. 
the accident made huge influence on many people and we have memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki so so that's why some people are against nuclear we have to recover the lost trust to the nuclear technology in Japan, not only nuclear technology, but generally the technology of Japan. I mean, most Japanese people understand that diversity is quite, uh, quite important. And if we simply uh, rely on nuclear energy, yes, it's rather dangerous. If we can deny on 100% renewable energy, we think it's uh, not stable. Diversification of the energy source is the best way to have energy security. So somehow we have to have nuclear power. There's another big reason why Japan needs to maintain the nuclear power. This is national security. Japan is uh, uh, surrounded by the nuclear country, right? North Korea, China, Russia. Of course, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki tragedy, we are not interested in building the weapon. But if we give up nuclear, I don't think we are sending good message to North Korea or China or Russia. We need nuclear power for national security. And we have to accept the current geopolitical risks surrounding us and maintain the nuclear power somehow. There are many challenges for us, but, but there are many opportunities for us to develop technology. And, and so uh, we shouldn't be afraid of that. Uh, we should be courageous. We have to have a big picture to really change the public mind here. Our visit to Fukushima Daiichi in early 2023 was sobering. But Japanese utilities are reopening many of their reactors. That gives me hope that nuclear energy can recover. I imagine it's similar to the hope President Eisenhower expressed back in 1953. Members of the General Assembly, when Secretary General Hammarskjöld's invitation to address this General Assembly reached me in Bermuda, I was just beginning a series of conferences with the prime ministers and foreign ministers of Great Britain and of France. Our subject was some of the problems that beset our world. To understand nuclear power, we have to go back to World War II. On the one hand, people were happy to have ended the war, but on the other hand, people had a lot of foreboding about these really powerful weapons. They knew right away, everybody knew, the experts, the public, that if there were to ever be a war fought with nuclear weapons, both sides would destroy themselves. Surely no sane member of the human race could discover victory in such desolation. It was Eisenhower himself who said, we have to find some positive vision to come out of this dark reality. The United States knows that peaceful power from atomic energy is no dream of the future. Against the dark background of the atomic bomb, the United States does not wish merely to present strength, but also the desire and the hope for peace. And it really inspired people and it became the overriding narrative of nuclear energy for the 1950s. There was a turn in the 60s towards trying to get rid of nuclear power plants. We are a gentle, angry people. And, we are and it was in some ways a kind of scapegoating of nuclear power plants for the frustrations that people were experiencing of not being able to get rid of nuclear weapons. That created a huge amount of anxiety among many people, and it also became an opportunity for progressives to basically demonize the whole of human civilization as self-destructive and as suicidal. They realize they can't get rid of nuclear weapons, and so they start to attack nuclear power plants. And at the same time, there was already demands for renewables and a return to renewables, away from fossil fuels and away from nuclear. 
So the hatred of nuclear became paired with the love of renewables. And you see all of the symbolism where nuclear was demonized, it became pictured as the devil. They said it was 100% safe, but they were wrong. And the irony, of course, is that in this spiritual quest for harmony with nature, we've ended up really degrading our natural landscapes. In an effort to reduce pollution for climate change, we've ended up increasing our reliance on natural gas plants by shutting down nuclear power plants. In an effort to sort of end inequality, we've actually increased poverty and increased inequality by making electricity and housing and food so expensive. I mean, it's really hard to look at their policy, especially when it comes to energy, and not see it as extremely anti-society and anti-human. And they use the full weight of their resources to act on that. If you're pro-nuclear, you're bringing a slingshot to the Cold War. The budgets of all of these environmental groups are absolutely massive. Sierra Club, Environmental Defense Fund, Natural Resources Defense Council have budgets of well over $100 million. They're all making money on this, investors in renewables and energy efficiency. But those two things are completely consistent. Uh, that These two motivations of wanting money and wanting spiritual uplift are two totally consistent motivations. Energy is unimportant if you're doing it right. But if you're doing it wrong, nothing in the world is more important than energy. It is the backbone of society. It's not that it's a problem that can't be solved. We have the technology, we know the answer. We know what we have to do, then why isn't anyone doing it? But someone is doing it. In 2023, Canadian policymakers reversed course and announced a huge expansion of their fleet of nuclear reactors. What happened? A tall ER doctor from Toronto decided things needed to change. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Kiefer. I am an emergency physician uh, working in Toronto, and uh, I'm the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. I've always been an activist. I didn't foresee this coming. You know, and if you talk to my 16-year-old self, they probably would have wanted to put a hit out on my future self. We are a nonprofit made up of scientists, doctors, engineers, environmentalists, and tradespeople who believe that nuclear energy is the keystone technology of our climate response and really is the gold standard template for a just transition. I was anti-nuclear um, for most of my life just because that's what everyone around me believed, because we're kind of on the left and we're kind of hippies and whatever else, right? The idea that, boy, oh boy, you can eat the uranium once it's I never spent. said that, Charlie. Well, you said you I, did. I you said, said if it sits long I said enough, after a thousand years, after a thousand, after a thousand years, years, the only way it could hurt you is if you pulverize it and ate it. I used to hold my breath when I drove down the highway past the nuclear plant, because I was, you know, afraid of being contaminated or something like that, right? Like, what a, what a sea change. Canadians for Nuclear Energy say any plans for a net zero future must center nuclear energy, which they say is one of the most efficient forms of power generation. Coal is a thousand grams of CO2 per But kilowatt. again, you've had a strong position in the past, so I'm just asking, has that changed based upon the scientific consensus of the IPCC that all four decarbonization pathways call for an increase in nuclear energy? I think I've answered your question. Okay. Thank you. I don't, I don't think you have, but that's okay. I never imagined myself, you know, advocating around energy. We're in the town and city formerly known as the Big Smoke, Toronto, Ontario. And the reason I say that is uh, it used to be pretty polluted. We had 54 smog days a year back in 2005. I grew up with a friend who basically couldn't leave the house all summer because he had bad asthma. Coal is one of the dirtiest fuels on the planet, but soon there will be very little of it used in Canada. We're a great city now in terms of our air quality. We had 53 smog days before the coal phase had occurred and we got that down to zero. Uh, and that's because we were able to phase out coal uh, completely off of our grid. This one plant provides enough energy to power the entire city of Toronto, home to nearly three million people. And it does it at a fraction of the price we pay in Australia. We have a world-class, deeply decarbonized grid. And when I learned that we'd done that with nuclear energy, you know, a little light went off in my head, and I was hooked. So we're right here, we're on the water, we're on Bay du Dor, uh, section here of uh, 
of uh, Lake Huron. There's Bruce A in the distance where we'll be going. My first trip to a nuclear plant, it was the largest operating nuclear plant in the world, uh, and that's Bruce Power uh, right here in Ontario. And it was really interesting because it was part of a labor tour. Some of the nuclear unions really wanted to bring in their brothers and sisters more broadly and show them the experience. We toured this, this facility. It's enormous. I mean, we really, I think, did things right in how we built nuclear in Ontario. You know, what you need is serial production of a standardized design over and over again, ideally on the same site. Hey Liz, how are you doing? Good, Stan. <laughs> Um, we're going to start doing a little plant tour, so we're going to walk around your unit if that's all right with you. When you think about the amount of electricity that comes out of this place, it's, it's unfathomable, really. Like, like a third of the homes in the province are powered by what goes on in this control room and the one at Bruce B. Well, these big things here, they're pretty cool. If there's a low demand on the provincial grid, we can actually take steam and divert it into the condensers without going through the turbine. And that's how we ramp up and down the actual electrical output of the unit without turning the reactor down itself. So my grandmother worked here. She worked in like the purchasing department when they were building this place in the construction days. My dad worked a whole career here, just retired. I was offered a job at OPG, which at the time was a good paying job at the Nanco Generating Station. So I worked there for three years. We used, to, we used to tell ourselves, oh, you know what, those smog days in Toronto, that's not this coal plant. And keep in mind, we're talking about the biggest coal plant in North America. The government said, oh, we're gonna close down uh, all the coal plants. That was kind of like an attack on our livelihood. They said, you know what, we're gonna shut down this coal plant, but nobody's gonna lose their job. Those fossil fuel workers, they were able to transition to even better jobs with the nuclear, much safer working conditions, not all the coal dust all over the place. Those folks making good wages, what do they do? They go and spend their money in their communities and create an enormous secondary economic benefit. We reap an incredible reward uh, from having developed this technology, from having the supply chain completely localized, um, to having the, the fuel source here. And I mean, that speaks to the energy security as well. This is really the proof of concept of a green nuclear deal and a coal phase out. And it was so cool meeting Dan because I'm, you know, constantly talking to legislators and coal communities about transitioning fossil fuel workers to nuclear jobs, jobs in clean energy that are high paying, that are generational, that are union backed. You know, nuclear is perhaps one of the most important technologies that we've ever created. And the industry has no idea how to communicate that. That Twitter thread on nuclear waste was, it was a wild ride. I wrote this thread about nuclear waste because it's been something I've been frustrated about for a while that Nuclear waste is used as something to discredit nuclear as clean, as a reason why we shouldn't be pursuing it, when in reality, you know, it's the best kind of waste we have. It's not leaky and green. It's not uniquely or inherently dangerous compared to other industrial waste we have. As an environmentalist, that's the selling point, is the waste. It's been 100% accident free. We just have these dry casks that sit on site that take up, you know, a fraction of the space of a parking lot and are regularly monitored. You can aim a missile at these casks. You can drive a train through these casks. They're virtually indestructible. Any act of man or God cannot destroy this thing. And it got 25 million views, you know. I went from 5,000 followers to 30,000 followers. I had, you know, people in Silicon Valley and hedge fund managers getting in touch with, it was just wild. So a few days ago, I was preparing to do this panel and I decided to just do a simple Google image search of nuclear waste. And this is what we see. Um, and I think it really speaks to something, which is that nuclear communication has been just terribly bad. 
But nuclear does have a problem, and nuclear waste specifically has a problem, which is that members of the public and policymakers think that there's a nuclear waste problem. We have decades of subtle anti-nuclear imagery uh, around the dangers, supposedly, of radiation. Uh, and you, you don't even notice it, really. You kind of just accept it as a fact, uh, when in reality, uh, it's a lot less dangerous than, than people think. Uh, just as an example, you get more radiation from eating a banana than living uh, within uh, 10 miles of a nuclear power plant, uh, on average, because of the naturally occurring potassium-40 that's in a banana. The fact of the matter is that in America, you're more likely to be shot by your dog than to die because of nuclear power, or be harmed even. People are terrified of nuclear on the basis that it, it, it's so dangerous. It isn't dangerous. I, no, I can't say it isn't. Nothing is not dangerous. I mean, for Pete's sake, eating and breathing at the same time can be dangerous. A person can choke. But the dangerous stuff is a solid. It's not going to leak out somewhere. You have to come up with elaborate scenarios before you can imagine uh, uh, fuel rods uh, uh, causing any harm to anybody. Well, you don't have to come out with an elaborate scenario, for example, for a coal ash pond, because they have slipped downstream and contaminated rivers and taken houses with them. The nuclear sector, nuclear workers, the nuclear industry has such an amazing story to tell. You know, in terms of, again, these clean air accomplishments, the climate benefits, and in Canada, our medical isotope production, which really enables modern healthcare around the world. These are extraordinary tales and stories that should be shared and, sh and we should be proud of. In general, the industry has not done a good job telling its story because it has a fantastic story to tell. Uh, but I am extremely heartened to see that has shifted a lot over the last six years. You can tell that there is a resurgence of support for nuclear power because policymakers have started to understand how important nuclear power is to our success. We are seeing the beginning, I think, of a rethink on nuclear and even a nuclear renaissance with countries like the UK, France, Poland, Estonia, others are really understanding and moving towards nuclear in a big way. Advanced manufacturing techniques, shipyards, we should be able to churn out nuclear plants as fast as we can build jet aircraft. The industry needs to deliver and the regulators have to let them deliver. Because a nuclear renaissance doesn't come along, you know, every five years, we have to take this opportunity that we've been given and not squander it because it's too important.